Well, God doesn't promise to remove all of our problems. He does promise to give us what we need to get through them. So if that's you this morning, you need that. I need that. We need the ability to know what to do about difficulties. We need the insight to get through difficulties, to keep a right attitude. In one word, I think the thing that we really need is wisdom. We need wisdom in dealing with difficulties. Someone has said the difference between knowledge and wisdom is this. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is actually a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put tomatoes in fruit salad. We need to be able to apply. We live in a world filled with knowledge, but we need to be able to rightly apply that knowledge in dealing with life's challenges. And I think we can do that this morning. I'd like you to turn with me to the letter that we call James. It's near the end of the New Testament. And in the very first verses of that letter this morning, we're going to be talking about this subject. You're going to see there's help to be found there. And there's the encouragement to ask God for it directly. We have access to this. God gets blamed for a lot of things. God gets credit for a lot of things he doesn't deserve credit for. Jack Jenkins, age 18, is running from the police on his motorcycle in Spencerville, Indiana, one evening. In his race to get away, he loses control, goes off of the road, hits a telephone pole, is instantly killed. Later that night at his home, I hear someone saying to his grieving parents, well, God just took him. You know, Jack's parents needed wisdom that night to handle their situation correctly. Not that nonsense. People digging out from Hurricane Helene right now, among other things that they need today. There's a list, and by the way, there's a list, and you can contribute to it. This is a side issue, because there's going to be two two semis coming through tomorrow on the way. And if you want to contribute to that, it's piling up outside the office right now. Uh, Get it here by noon. Those people need wisdom. They need a lot of practical things, but one of the things that they need is wisdom to know how to deal with what they're going through. So James begins his letter with these words. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. 12 tribes in the dispersion. It's another way of saying to those people who have been scattered. And as James writes to Christians who are enduring some hard times, he wants them to understand some things. Read on. He wants them to understand the source of their trials. In verse 13, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. In other words, James says, and and I say to you this morning, let's not wrongly credit God with things he doesn't do. When you're faced with the temptation to be angry, to lust, to give in to your convictions or to give away your convictions, don't blame God. He's not the one tempting you. Where does that come from? I'm glad you asked that. Because James goes on then in verse 14 to say, where does that come from? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. A little boy was confessing to his mother that he went swimming in the pond at his friend's house when she had explicitly told him not to. He was explaining how that happened. She asked him, why did you take your swimming trunks with you? He said, that was in case I got tempted to swim. (laughs) 
James says about these things, don't be deceived, dear brothers. God isn't toying with us. God isn't wanting us to stumble, just waiting to trip us. He isn't the author of temptation and failure. No, look at verse 17. Just the opposite of that is true. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The good things come from God. By the way, there are two different words used in the book of James that get applied to God here and how he deals with us. God doesn't tempt us. We we just read that. The devil tempts us to bring us down. But God, in verse 3 it says, tests us. It's a different word to grow us up. God lets us go through some tests in the school of life. They're usually pop quizzes, which means you better be paying attention because they're going to come up and you don't want to be caught off guard. But the neat thing is about it, he lets us grade our own papers. So we get to learn from it. He doesn't test us so he can see how well we have learned or how well we're doing. He tests us. He already knows that. He tests us so that we can know how we're doing. God knew that Abraham trusted him. God knew that Abraham ultimately would set his son Isaac on an altar and raise a knife to kill him because God had told him to do it. And God stopped him at that last moment and said, don't do it. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Did God learn something that day? No, he already knew it. He was letting Abraham grade his own paper that day. And guess what? Abraham got an A+. James says in verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. God tests us to grow us up. He doesn't tempt us to bring us down. And still you might ask, well then, Why does he endanger us at all? Why allow us to go into harm's way? Why not just remove every potential reason that there is for us to stumble? That's why we need to listen and understand not only where it comes from, but what testing can do for you. It's not that everything happens for a reason. I hear that sometimes. Everything has a reason. That's not what James says. It doesn't say that, does it? I would rather acknowledge this, that no matter what happens, God can use it for his purposes, even if we don't understand it. Look at verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The word for steadfastness here isn't just a a passive word that means you just put up with everything. You know, men, it's not like you having to sit through a a chick flick with your wife, all right? And guys or or ladies, it's not like you having to sit through a, a ball game with your husband, all right? It's not like that. It's an active thing. It's a lot more like the endurance that a runner calls upon to be able to run a marathon, Steadfastness. Deborah Johnson of Dublin, Ohio, tells a story of her seven-year-old daughter who wanted, she thought, to take violin lessons. So she took her daughter to a music store to rent an instrument. She wanted her to understand the importance of practicing. So as they went, she was explaining to her that violin lessons were expensive and that sometimes she wouldn't feel like practicing It would be hard. She said, there may be times when you feel like giving up, but I want you to hang in there and keep on trying. And her little seven-year-old daughter nodded and in her most serious voice said, it'll be just like marriage, right, Mommy? (laughs) Well, sometimes maybe. 
But you know what? People who endure marriage when it's tough will tell you that sticking with it can build a good thing. And if you never go through any challenges in your marriage, you're not watching it grow as much as it could. Amen? If you're interested in being perfect and complete and not lacking anything, like James says here, then you're going to have to go through some stuff. You know, the man most widely accepted as the greatest American president is a good example. When he was seven years old, his family was forced out of their home and he had to go to work. When he was nine, his mother died. He lost his job as a store clerk when he was 20. He wanted to go to law school, but he didn't have the education to be accepted. At age 23, he went into debt to be a partner in a small store. Three years later, his business partner died, and the resulting debt that he incurred took years for him to repay. When he was 28, after he had courted a girl he loved for four years, he asked her to marry him. She said no. At age 37, on his third try... He was elected to Congress, but then he failed to be reelected. His son died at age four. When Abraham Lincoln was 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At age 47, he ran for the vice presidency and lost. And at age 51, he was elected president of the United States on the verge of civil war. He led the nation during some of its most difficult times, and somehow in his life, he learned to face discouragement and move beyond it. It was Abraham Lincoln who, in the middle of the Civil War in 1863, established a national day, a national day for the celebration of Thanksgiving. Lincoln had learned how important it is to stop and thank God in the midst of great difficulties. Listen to what he said. I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. You see, he's an example of a person who understood the source for wisdom, the one that we're looking at today. There is wisdom to be found in God's word, and there is, listen, wisdom to be found in prayer. Central, we can do better at this as a church. We can do better at being a praying people. And for today and two more weeks, we're going to camp out on that subject in the hopes that we can grow in this. We can read about how to deal with hard times. We can learn all there is to understand about it. But when we find ourselves thick in the middle of it, we may still need help putting it all together. And James says, if that's where you are, then you ought to ask God for wisdom. You ought to pray for wisdom. So let's consider how there is wisdom for life to be found in prayer, praying for it. But first, a word of caution. Either you believe it or you can forget about it. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be what? It will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. There's an old story about the preacher of a small farming community who, along with the church, called a special prayer service. They were going through a time of drought, and they were going to gather together to pray. And everybody showed up for the prayer meeting, and the preacher looked out over the crowd, and he said, none of you brought an umbrella. We're not going to pray. There was a minister in New Hall, California, who preached about faith, and he told that old story. And everyone listened to that story. The following Wednesday evening, as he opened up a Bible study and his head was bowed in prayer, there was a rustling sound. And when he looked up, everybody in the congregation had an umbrella opened up over them. They got him pretty good. James says in this prayer for wisdom, you can't just kind of toss it up with a hopeful 
maybe God will possibly do this. I like the way the message paraphrase puts these couple of verses. It reads this way, ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. God isn't impressed or honored by half-hearted requests that you really don't believe can happen. When you ask him for this help, you need to have confidence that he'll give it. That's what James says first of all. When you pray for this wisdom, you've got to pray believing. Now let's look at it again, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. That tells me something about this. Number one, you won't be overlooked. The first reassurance that you have when you ask God is that he is a generous giver of wisdom. There's not a shortage it's not like you're the last one in line at the church potluck so you don't get any lasagna. Okay? God gives generously to all, James says. When you come to him asking for help, you're not the first. He knows ahead of time what you need. He knows ahead of time how much there is a need for, and he's not going to fail you. He gives generously to all. There was another storm in, well, it wasn't a storm, but in January of 2005, remember the day after Christmas, there was a tsunami in the Indian Ocean that swept shores and resulted in the death of some 230,000 people. Entire communities were swept away, uh, kind of like what we're looking at on the news these days in the southeast. And funds were collected like they are being collected these days. And organizations got together. And one of those that got together was White Fields Overseas Evangelism. It was headed up by Reggie Thomas, who was one of the elders of the church we were at. And Reggie was talking about some of the funds that they had gathered. And he said he was faced with a really tough situation for India, where they had been doing a lot of work. He said it was impossible he had to decide how to spend $33,000 to help those people. <laughs> and some of you are going, man, if that's a trial or tribulation, send some my way, right? Well, actually, it was tough because, you see, the money was given to help people who were living in fishing villages along the east coast of India that were destroyed by the tsunami. And those people lost everything. And they were living, a lot of them, thousands of them, in big, just lean-tos on the beaches along the ocean. How could he make a decision about how much to give to whom without causing problems, without causing jealousy and hurt feelings? If he used it for food, it wouldn't go very far. If he tried to divide it up among everybody, you can bet there would be people who would be overlooked and it wouldn't go well. So he prayed, and others prayed, and asked God for wisdom. What do we do? How can we best help? And the answer for that came through the elders of the churches there in India. And they took that money, and they purchased fishing boats and nets. And that way, the survivors could support themselves, get back on their feet. It worked out really well. God gave wisdom to his people when they asked. I'm glad that God or that uh, James included this fact that God is generous. He generously gives to all. And in the case of wisdom, he says, he'll give it. You won't be overlooked. Look what else he says there in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, which means you won't be criticized. The word has to do with insulting someone or shaming them. It's a, a word that's used to describe how people insulted Jesus as he was on the cross. James says, no, this thing that comes from God, as he answers your prayer for wisdom, it's going to be done generously and it's going to be done without insult. How many questions have gone unasked and unanswered because of shame? You want to ask a girl out, but she might say no. So what do you do? 
you don't ask. You feel moved to tell somebody about Jesus, but you're afraid they might ridicule you or you might look weird doing it, so you don't try. And you really are in need for help, and you're afraid of seeking it because there's a certain shame in asking for help, supposedly. James wants us to remember that not only is God generous with this offer, he's also not going to make it into an issue of shame. Openly ask God for wisdom. There's no shame in that. You're not going to be ridiculed for that. You're not the only person who needs it. He's not going to come back to you with a list of all the reasons that you don't deserve it. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. James says this to the church. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. James seems to think that if you have a need, you ought to take that to God and he will help you with it. Isn't that revolutionary thinking? That's the kind of relationship we ought to have with God. That's the kind of relationship I would like our church family to mature and to develop as a culture among us. 1910, <laughs> there was a border crossing from Mexico by the bull weevil. It came into the American South and it wiped out the cotton crops of the farmers there, forcing them to diversify by planting peanuts and other new crops. They had all been, as a general rule, just depending on planting cotton, and really they needed not to do that because that was depleting the soil. So the bull weevil came in, ruined the cotton crops, made them change what they were doing, and growers in Enterprise, Alabama, were so grateful because it brought prosperity that they had to change. They loved the work of the destructive boll weevil for ending their one crop dependency that they eventually so much loved they put up a monument to the boll weevil in their town square in 1919. It's real, it's still there. Looks like Lady Liberty and they're holding over her head there's this disc with a giant boll weevil on it. The thing's big. They claim it is the largest monument in the world in honor of a bug. In 1910, the boll weevil seemed like a messenger from Satan, but they created a plaque that goes with this, and it reads like this. In profound appreciation for the boll weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity, this monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. Time has a way of putting things into a right perspective sometimes. Now that may sound backwards, but God has a way of helping us look at difficulties in reverse. What we need is wisdom to be able to do that. Wouldn't you like to? Wouldn't you like to be able to look at whatever that thing is that you identified earlier as your trial in life? and face it with wisdom, you can. You can relate to the hardest things in life with wisdom, and it starts with being in a right relationship with God. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. 
See how that starts? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You can have that this morning by being in a right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ.